Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, you should each give as you have decided, not with regret or out of a sense of duty, for God loves the one who gives cheerfully. As God's child, I want to share. Please join in prayer to God for the vision provided to our church today. Lord, I thank you for the dedication of our senior pastor, Rich McDermott, associate pastor, Chris Campbell, all the First Presbyterian staff, the vision speaker, Tim Cook, and all the volunteer servants. I pray too for the congregation as we listen and pray together to see your way. Please help us focus on your vision. I pray for unity in the group as we listen and understand the ideas for the best future for our church. Thank you, Father, for the men and women who had vision in the past for the establishment of First Presbyterian Church Arlington. Thank you for this building and property where we worship today. Thank you especially for the financial provision, unity, and sacrifices of men and women many years ago. Please help us continue to experience the inspiration you gave and you still give. And help us as a church and as individuals to follow your guidance. Holy Spirit, please touch our hearts and show us your way to respond to the vision for the future. Unite and inspire us to give what you provide. Please accept our prayer as we join together in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's mercy, peace be with you all. Father, as we humbly come before you with our many petitions this morning, we confess that we may have doubts and fears that are present. And how well do we know that uh, many times fear can paralyze and cause us not to move in any direction. But Lord, you made it clear that we can't stay in the exact place anymore. Your word tells us that fear is not from you. And you repeatedly tell us to not be afraid but to be strong and take courage, not because of anything we can do, but because you are with us. And you say that a lot, so it must be important. And so Lord, we need your help. Help us to not allow fear to prevent us from embracing where you are leading us. Help us to embrace the plans you have for us, your church, as well as the community we seek to serve in your name. Help us to relinquish our plans so that we can embrace yours, because Lord, you're doing something big and we don't wanna miss out. Lord, you are all sovereign and all good. And if we stand firm in this, we know we can trust that your plans for us are good. Help us to see the vision you have for us through your eyes and from your perspective. And help us to find rest and hope because we know that you can do immeasurably, immeasurably more than anything that we could ask or imagine. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Wanda and Jamie, and want to invite Larry Stevenson forward to give us an update on what's happening with our roofs at this moment and, uh, and other things. Thank you, Larry. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, for those who have not been uh, present during some of the updates, let me kind of start back a couple of months ago. Our roof bid documents went out to the roofing contractors for bid approximately the first part of August. Those bids were received two, two and a half weeks later. They have been reviewed, they've been tabulated, and we have identified uh, the contractor that we, that we wish to work with uh, for this endeavor. Um, as far as the claim is concerned, now that we've got some real live numbers to discuss with our adjuster, uh, I'm in the process now of setting up some very meaningful meeting, meetings in the next couple of weeks to spotlight those differences and to hopefully work to a successful conclusion on our claim. So pray for that process, pray for understanding, pray for open minds, uh, and pray that, uh, that the Lord will lead us through this dark part uh, to uh, a path of betterment for this church building. Thank you. Great. Let's say thanks to Larry for his uh, hard work on bird diving this. Yeah.
First of all, thank you for being here and for caring about God's mission for this church and about our vision for the future. Thank you also for coming early or staying late or canceling your Sunday school classes. I know that is an inconvenience, but this is an important meeting and we hope you'll understand how important it is by what you hear today. Some of you will be shocked by what you hear today, whether it is about the condition of this building or the cost of repairing and upgrading this building or the cost even of moving elsewhere or the ways that we are now unfortunately actually turning people away from FPCA, it's hard to hear. It may sound like we are neglecting or even betraying God's mission for us, but we believe now is the time to recover God's mission for us. And I want to talk briefly about the attitude in the spirit that I hope every one of you will bring to this meeting today. Think briefly about the shock you might have if you were to discover, for example, that the young female leader of our youth group, who is an amazingly faithful young woman, had become pregnant out of wedlock. That would be a shock. That actually happened to me 32 years ago in another church. But the Lord did an amazing and wonderful thing with that that I will have to share at another time, not this morning. Compare that shock, though, with what happened to Mary, the mother of Jesus, 2,000 years ago when she was told that she would become pregnant. Consider how she responded. She, too, was utterly shocked. This was, for her at least on a human level, a disaster, forcing many changed plans and dreams, and perhaps causing her even to fear for her life. Mary said to the angel, perhaps somewhat desperately, how can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel Gabriel said, of course, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Gabriel then tells Mary what has happened to her relative Elizabeth, who was also pregnant in her old age, and he concludes by saying, for nothing will be impossible with God. Think about that. That's when perhaps Mary paused briefly and says, here am I the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. This is an attitude and response to God worth emulating for us today. Think about it. Mary did not then go and whine to her friends and neighbors about all that God was expecting of her. She went off quietly to visit Elizabeth another deeply spiritual woman who was also stunned but blessed by this shock in her life. Later, as you remember, the shepherds came to Jesus' birth and told Mary about the announcement of the angels that they had received. And we're told then that Mary treasured all of these words and pondered them in her heart. So we're urging each one of you here today to pray, to consider what God is calling you to do, to consider your role as a servant of the Lord, and to take time to ponder all these things in your heart before you say or do anything else. James chapter 1 says, Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. So, as I mentioned earlier, this is a presentation today. It is not a dialogue because of time, which is why we want you to write down your comments and your questions so that we can address them in a separate format with written answers. We thank you for coming here today with a humble, serving, and believing heart. I hope that some of you have noticed 
the needs of our building. Here is a sampling of what I have written in my annual report for the past four years. For 2015, four years ago, I said, our large aging building is in need of refurbishing, repair, and upgrades that we are starting to plan out and achieve. A new fire alarm system took all of 2015 to complete and install. The wood of the pews and chancel area need refinishing. A new ramp is needed near the preschool. We have needed new and better outdoor signage for the better part of two decades. We need carpet, paint, repair, cleaning, redecorating to be done nearly everywhere. We need wireless internet access throughout the building and we are planning for some technical upgrades to the audio-visual capabilities in all the rooms, including the sanctuary and the chapel. That was four years ago that I wrote that. Three years ago, our large aging building received a few upgrades and required lots of attention. A generous donation and some amazing hard work transformed the bride's room into an elegant gathering space once again. I thank people for that. I said the parlor is next on the list. That hasn't happened. And there were several other folks who helped paint the preschool and nurse, nursery hallways. The family bathroom restained some of the outside doors, which happened again recently. The building is starting to look much better, I said. But the brand new fire alarm that we installed in 2015 proved to be a literal nightmare for most of 2016. More than 70 false alarms, many in the middle of the night, eventually made the fire marshal require a 24-hour surveillance of our building with hourly walkthroughs costing the church more than $24,000 for night security for nearly three months. The wood of the pews in the chancel area has received some attention, I said. A new ramp will be installed near the preschool. The session is exploring some technical upgrades to the audio-visual capabilities in all the rooms, including the chapel and sanctuary. A new roof, I'm writing this three years ago, is needed on the building and new signage. They're both expensive upgrades that will need to happen in the near future. 2017, two years ago, the building continues to need significant upgrades, repair, and attention. A new roof, new audiovisual capabilities, new flooring and carpeting, new ceilings, a new sign, upgraded classrooms and spaces are greatly needed. Two years ago I said this. And I said a capital campaign may happen in the near future. Stay tuned. That was two years ago. 2018, one year ago, we anticipate doing a capital campaign to repair and improve our building in 2019, so it is wise not to increase the annual budget too aggressively this year. So these annual reports mention the obvious things that we wanted people to know about and we wanted to be public. These annual reports, however, did not mention the things that we didn't want to talk about. They do not mention the water leak that soaked the sanctuary foundation for between three and four months before it was fixed. They don't mention the gas line leak in the preschool area that was smelled by staff early one morning that could easily have exploded either destroying the entire building early in the morning or possibly injuring people. And it sent utility people scrambling to our facility. They don't mention the animals that have made this facility their home and have required us to call authorities. I'm not going to go into details. <laughs> And we don't often highlight the leaks, the stains, the falling ceilings, and the general lack of cleanliness. The Lord has used a variety of things in my four and a half years here to get my attention 
And he's got it now. <laughs> and I hope he's getting yours as well. It's my privilege to invite forward now Tim Cool, who is the owner and operator of Cool Solutions that helps hundreds of churches across our country to plan and envision building changes that will help them fulfill their mission that God has assigned them. Let's welcome Tim forward if we will. Can you all hear me okay? Good deal. Well, thank you for having me back um, in Arlington. I commit to have you out of here in time for the ball game. <laughs> um, is that what you said, Rich? Yeah. Okay. Um, I know many of you are going to the 2 o'clock game, so I promise to have you out of here by then. Um, I'll give you a little background on myself. I've been involved with church facilities now for 35 years. Um, I was very young when I started, <laughs> like 12. Um, and what our company specializes in is helping churches with the two areas of leadership related to facilities. I'm a, I'm a firm believer that everything on earth belongs to God. The pews you're sitting in, the cars you drove in, the houses you live in, the buildings that we worship in. And if we truly believe that it all belongs to God, then he has entrusted them to us to properly steward. And I believe that there will come a day that we won't just be held responsible for how we spent money on our mortgage and our cars and our children, but also on how we cared for God's house. So the two areas of leadership that we try to assist churches with is number one, according to Max Dupree, the two things a leader must do is number one, face reality, and number two, cast a vision for the future. Those are the two things that our company, when we were engaged by FPCA, are the two things that we looked at. So we did two reports. The first report that we did was a facility condition assessment. We came into your facility as a first time guest, which we were, and we went through the building as to what would a first time guest experience be. Then we looked at it from a more technical perspective. What's the condition of the building? How much deferred maintenance is there? Is there proper planning for the future inevitable costs necessary? Let me, let me ask this. How many of you are planning for retirement at some point in time? Anybody? Okay, most of you are. I am too, and for some of you, maybe it's sooner than later. <laughs> so what, one, of the, one of the things with, with personal retirement is we start setting money and things aside to be ready for when we're going to need it at a later time. In a facility, that's called a capital reserve plan. Unfortunately, the church doesn't have one because inevitably you will retire every aspect of this building. It's way overdue to retire the roofing. It's way overdue to retire the HVAC systems and so on and so forth. Now there may be some things here that we never retire such as the wood arches those may last for generations yet to come. But most of your other building components are going to be retired, so what are we doing to plan for that? So as we met with the session and the staff, and we had multiple meetings over multiple days, some of the things that we heard as far as the visions that they had as leaders was to be relevant to the immediate community, becoming a well. So for some of you, that will mean nothing. To the leadership, it means something. We looked at the John 4 passage of the woman at the well. She did not wake up that morning and say, hey, I'm gonna go meet Jesus, won't that be cool? She woke up to do an everyday task. And we all remember she had her experience with Christ. We, most of us remember she went back to her village, but what we fail to remember most times is what she did next. She didn't load up the family camel and take everybody to the temple. She brought them back to the well. So how do we create more well opportunities on our campuses instead of just temple experiences? The second thing that we heard was to provide a community component that the leadership felt is currently missing. Third, alternative utilization of the campus to enhance the vision, 
community outreach opportunities, clearly identified entrances. My first trip here, I pulled in on the wrong side of the parking lot. And then I got caught in the school uh, PE class doing their laps to where I couldn't even get to the right side of the building to find an entrance. So again, as a first time guest, that was my experience. More secure kids' spaces. We as a church, and I mean capital C, not this local church, are dealing with things that were unthinkable 20 years in the church. Things of active shooters, child abductions, and things like that. I grew up in a pastor's home. We never dealt with those things. We left the church buildings unlocked most of the time. Not anymore. So we are dealing with things, and as you start thinking about who is not here yet, and who we want to reach, if it's going to include families with small children, we have to take seriously the safety and security of those children. More community space, there's, there's really, I mean, you have the narthex here, you've got the, the little foyer area over by the um, office area, but there's not a large area where you all can kind of meet and greet and cross paths between services and Sunday school. Intentionally organized space. Right now the space is a little bit of a hodgepodge, a little bit here, a little bit there, and so it doesn't, doesn't flow real well, again, for a first time guest. For those of you that call FBCA home, it works just fine. And frankly, if, if it's only gonna be us four and no more, then you don't need to do anything other than make some repairs. But if we're preparing for a future generation, then there's some other things that need to be considered. And then as already mentioned, some improved technology. These were the things that we heard from the leadership team. So some, some general observations, and these were made by part of my staff that looked at this just from the facility condition aspect, not thinking through maybe what we can do with the facility. The campus is confusing and hard to navigate. Invite a first time friend that's never been to this church on a Sunday, don't walk around with them and tell them that they need to go find some room and see how easy it is for them to navigate the space. It's quite difficult to navigate. I won't call it a rat's maze, uh, although that may be some of the animals that are currently uh, <laughs> making a boat here at the church, uh, but it is difficult. We've seen uh, much worse, but we've seen much better as well. Where is the entrance? My staff, when they pulled up, had the same problem finding where was the entrance to come in as I did. The interior feels tired. And please don't see this as a disparagement. These are observations of people that have never been to your building before. So you take, don't shoot the messenger, okay? No tomato throwing today during the, this presentation. The sanctuary space feels disproportionate. We did a, a quick study to say, if you were to double your attendance over the next five to 10 years, how much square footage would you need? And candidly, you have too much square footage in this entire campus, but some of it is disproportionate. This room is gorgeous, okay? You need to hear me, this is an, an incredibly worshipful room, but it's too big for the current congregation, and frankly, it's too big even if you doubled. So there are some things like that, that that are going to, I hate to use it this way, that plays against us as far as how do we best utilize space. There's too many seats, so it feels like a dying church. When we attended the services here, when you walk in, it's sprinkles of people everywhere. So as a first time guest, it doesn't feel like it's a growing church, it feels like it's a dying church. Are the facilities or help helping or hindering fulfilling the vision? These are, these are questions that we ask the staff and the leadership. Are the facilities congruent with the community? I'm not meaning that we need to keep up with the Joneses, but is it congruent with the other regular activities that our community experiences and participates in? So during our facility condition assessment, and I'm sure if anyone wants a copy, um, it, the session can make it available. Uh, if you need good go to sleep reading at night, it will do it for you. It's about 60 pages long. We identified $1.8 million of deferred maintenance. Okay, let that sink in. My guess is these buildings originally didn't even cost that much to build. 
Today, we have $1.8 million in deferred maintenance. Many of these are immediate and at risk type of things. A number of items could be addressed as part of a renovation or an initiative based on what we're going to uh, discuss later as far as a master plan. The most critical being roofing. Thank you for the update on the roofing. Uh, the HVAC systems, the condition of the parking and the flooring, which Rich mentioned was in his report four years ago, so we're still dealing with flooring. Um, so those are things uh, that, that we look at, that we saw as part of the deferred maintenance. Your um, operational budget issues. We took your existing operating budget and we looked at how does that compare to other churches around the country. Um, when we looked at this, you're not investing enough in general maintenance. Well, he, one of the things, and I, I can't say that this is how you all have looked at your budget, but this is how many churches we deal with that have seen a reduction in attendance they deal with their budget. As they say, facilities should be a percentage of our annual budget. That just doesn't work because you may have reduced your budget by 50%, but you have the same amount of square footage to maintain. You can't look at your buildings as a, as a percentage of budget. You still have the same amount to heat and to cool and to clean and the same amount of roofs, whether or not you have grown or declined in attendance. There's not investing enough money in facility staff. There's marginally investment adequate in your janitorial. You're close on national averages, but a little behind. And there's a significant issue with no capital reserve. There's no retirement IRA for your building. Okay, there is none of that right now. So, and unfortunately, I have not yet found a social security plan for buildings. So we can't rely on that either. Now we, we did something else that I've not shared with, with Rich and his team yet. I did this after we gave the report. I went back in and said, if the church over the last 20 years had spent the right amount of money on general maintenance and facility staff, how much would we have spent? And I came up with about $900,000 you would have spent in 20 years. Instead of having that in our budget, we're now going to have to find a way to raise $1.8 million to fix the things that we should have been fixing over the last 20 years. You have to question our stewardship. And I'm not questioning you, I'm just questioning the stewardship overall. So, some next steps. We think you need to develop a plan to address the deferred maintenance. And deferred maintenance just means things that should have been done that haven't been done. So things that we keep putting off for a rainy day or until we have the money to do it. Review and adjust janitorial and maintenance budgets. Review and adjust facility staffing model. Initiate capital reserve planning and implementation of the same. And then see the master plan report to avoid addressing above items with work that may already be implemented as part of a repair. So what we're suggesting is just don't immediately go try to fix $1.8 million worth of stuff. But look at it in context of what another renovation and repurposing of your space is, because some of it may be the same. There's no reason to do a bunch of work and then find out, oh, we're going to rip that new work out because we're going to do it this way. So do them in harmony with each other. So then we looked at the campus from a master planning perspective. And the first thing we did was ask the staff, again, how is the facility hampering you from doing ministry? Winston Churchill made a comment. He said, we shape our buildings, and thereafter they shape us. Most churches we work with do church the way their building tells them to do church, not necessarily the way they would like to do church in 2019. So we try to ask the question, how would you like to do ministry? And then how do we make that work within the, the facilities God has already entrusted to you? So some of the concerns, some of this is going to sound repeat. This is a different group of people on my staff that looked at it. So if you see something that you heard or saw on an earlier slide, I would probably take attention to that because it comes from two different groups of people. Hard to navigate as a guest. 
Too much square footage for the congregation size. However, square, fi square footage is not in optimal locations. If we were going to take what you needed in ministry square footage and start brand new, we would not organize the spaces the way they're currently organized. The way th these spaces are organized is what worked when this building was built, not necessarily how we do things uh, today. Limited commons. There's not a place where you can all socialize and cross paths with each other. The capacity of the sanctuary exceeds weekly requirements, even a 100% growth in attendance. There's no front door. We can make an argument that that's the front door, but is it really? Front door is generally where everyone knows where to go in. Has anybody ever been to Disney World or Disneyland? Okay, you all make too much money. Um, so when you go to Disney and you turn down Main Street USA, what's the first thing you see? The big castle. You know what? There's not a single sign that says go there to go to the castle. It is an obvious visual clue and cue to a first-time guest. Same thing applies with our church buildings. When a first-time guest pulls into our parking lot, hopefully the right side of the parking lot, is it obvious where they need to come into the building? You have lots of doors and lots of options, so which is the one I should come into? There's no accessible bathrooms. Matter of fact, you have very little handicap accessibility that actually meets code today. Very dated and tired feeling. I've already reiterated that. And then the lack of security, especially in the children's areas. So some of the things that we looked at then was, should we relocate? Should we just sell this building and move to a new site? Um, we do this regularly with churches because we want to make sure that we're exploring all of the options and don't go into a project with a preconceived notion. So we looked at, you know, can we sell the, the current property? Who would want it? I mean, it's zoned residential which means to buy it for its current value, it would only be able to put houses on it, maybe multifamily. How much land would we need? Well, we, we looked at what a doubling of your congregation would be, and we said you need about five acres of land is what you would need. So then what is the cost and availability of five acres of land, and where would we want it? Would we want it in this community? Do we want it further south, further north? Do we want to be closer to where everyone lives? Does relocation impact the vision? This goes back to the earlier slides where I said where the session and, lead and staff had told us what vision was. We could probably get by with building only about 30,000 square feet. You've got about 40,000 now, um, which would help reduce your operational cost. You know, if we generally figure you need about five to five dollars and fifty cents a square foot annually for operation costs. Well, so, well, if you're only doing that on thirty thousand versus forty, obviously there's there's savings there. New construction will take two and a half to three years after land is is acquired. So at the very least, you're going to have to repair this building to some extent while you continue would continue to occupy here. If a sale of the existing is required to fund the new, then that length could be extended. The average time to sell a church on residential property that doesn't have commercial value is three plus years. That's national average. Because it is a specific user, it, it, it just elongates things. Given that, you still have to function at the current facility, and as such, you need to address your significant issues, such as your roofing, HVAC, and the like. We did a quick study then to say, how much would it cost you to relocate? In our opinion, this well exceeds the financial capability of the church as it is right now. We're looking at 12 to 14 million by the time you buy the land, develop parking, develop all the utilities, build the new building, buy new audiovisual systems, all new furniture and all the other things that go with it, 12 to 14 million dollars. We made the assumption 
And this was a wild guess. Anyone familiar with the term swag? That's what this was. Assuming that you could get $2 million out of the sale of this property. Maybe with $1.8 million of deferred maintenance, if another church wanted to buy it, they'd have to invest $1.8 million just to bring it up to snuff. We could start sm smaller, but would uh, still exceed financial feasibility. So we don't see relocation as a viable option. So then we stepped back and said, okay, what can we do with the existing facility to make it contextual and function the way we want it to in 2019 and beyond the way that we see ourselves wanting to do ministry from this point forward? So our team, we came up with all sorts of stuff. Isn't it amazing that a grown man can make a living coloring? <laughs> um, but we, we've come up with a number of ideas. We think we have landed on some. I'm gonna go through a couple slides real quick. Some of these are in, in handouts that I saw at the, um, at the back of the, the room in the narthex. But we looked at how can we best utilize the campus? How can we, how can we make things more obvious? How can we structure things so that things flow better, so that there's more um, obvious entrance points and whatnot. We looked at how do we rearrange the space you already have. As I've already said, you have too much square footage. You probably have at least 25 to 30% more than you need, even if you double. So instead of building new, how do we repurpose what you already have? I mean, again, the, the men and women whose shoulders bore the cost of all of this need to be honored. So why, why not enhance it and utilize what you've already been blessed with? We looked at ways to try to engage the community from the street view. Right now, if you drive by this in the middle of service, unless you look into the parking lot, you don't know that there's anybody here. You don't see people interacting out front. You don't see uh, life going on. You can't really look into the buildings that have glass. You just, you don't. And so how do we better utilize the space to draw some, um, what we call activate the site? And how do we make this a more um, community friendly environment that maybe has some wells going back to John 4? So then what are next steps? Is this where we take the offering? No, just kidding. <laughs> so the first thing I encourage the, the session to do is pray. This is not to be taken lightly. Again, I believe that there are spiritual ramifications to how we handle our facility stewardship. So first and foremost, let's pray about it. Consider what is the greatest kingdom impact. When you start looking at the things that need to be done, what's going to have greatest impact? There are some things that just need to be done. Okay, we need to stop the leaks, and we need to repair the rooms, like the old pastor's office. Has anybody been in the old pastor's office lately? 103? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of damage in that. There's a couple rooms that really should not be occupied at all in your building right now because the, the ceilings have collapsed in. Then address all your physical and functional obsolescence. Consider what fulfills the vision Set your priorities. And the reason why that is so critical is with the amount of things that need to be done, you probably can't do it all at one time unless someone writes a really big check. So it's going to have to be done in a prioritization manner. Review your financial options. As Rich has said uh, for the last two years now, plan on a capital campaign and then pray some more. That is, that's, that's what we discovered. I see great potential for you all here in this location. And uh, so please don't see any of this as a negative. See this more as, okay, now we have seen reality. We see a vision for the future. Now how do we get there? Thank you so much for your time. Great. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Tim and your team and everyone that's worked so hard uh, on our behalf. One of our early leadership meetings, we had uh, staff members, elders, deacons, leaders around sit at the table. 
and uh, we were asked, what excites you most at FPCA? And there are a lot of things that you can be excited about, but the most common answer going around the table usually uh, revolved around youth and children's ministries. And having worked in youth ministry and working around and with children's ministry, that's a tall order <laughs> asking our staff to operate within these current confines. Um, it's, it's really difficult, to put it nicely, and they do a great job with working with what they have. And so something else we talk about is our hospitality, our friendliness, which I believe we are. Uh, most churches think they are, but I know we are. Um, and so sometimes what we need is a building that corresponds with our friendliness of people um, because we have barriers to hospitality currently. And I didn't tell Tim, uh, I was going to ask him this, I bet you know this statistic. Uh, how much time, so when a first time guest comes to a church, um, how soon do they decide whether or not they're going to come back? Did you hear that? Seven seconds. All right, so you haven't, sh you haven't shaken a hand, you haven't said hello. Um, it's long before they get to shake our smiling, our hands and smiling faces at the back of the room uh, if we catch them on the way out, okay? So that's before really any personal interaction. So uh, that has to do with our facility and our site and our campus being as welcoming <clears throat> as possible. And then by not doing what we're, uh, what I think what we're saying are the basics here, we're sending the message to members like yourself, regular attendees, and especially young families that honestly, we take them for granted. And I don't say that to sound scary or any kind of, kind of emotional blackmail or threatening. Um, it's just the reality of what we're hearing. Uh, one of our young leaders in one of our early meetings said, we come here despite of the building. And it's one of the things, if you're a parent or you bring you know, grandchildren or something, you, it's, it's impossible not to see. Um, <clears throat> I will say that soon after Tim presented this, not that meeting, but in a month or two afterwards, uh, you know, the session chewed on this for quite a while and uh, decided that this was the direction they felt God was leading us. And to be honest, there aren't a lot of options, uh, which eliminates some hard choices, uh, but it kind of, in my humble opinion, gives us an easy option to go with um, because there's not a lot we can do. There aren't a lot of luxuries that Tim has presented or that I think the staff and leaders have asked for. Like, and these are basics like security and accessibility. I look at kind of the both ends of my family spectrum, right? Uh, with my two young children. Um, at this time, uh, Hudson uh, is down on the, on the nursery end of the building, right? So that's one dark corner that, again, you have to really know you're going to get there. So you go pick him up. Well, Colton is an older elementary Sunday school way down the, what used to be known as the Brown Hall, in the last room on the left, again, uh, from one corner to the other. All of it totally unsecured with, I don't know how many open doors in between. So these are the basics that parents, when we see this, I mean, our schools do incredible jobs taking safety and security uh, measures to protect kids. We should be doing the same thing. It's not an option. We have to do it. And as Tim has been talking about, we have a responsibility to steward this building so that it can be that place of welcome for the widow, for the orphan, the young and the old, and those with mobility challenges. Yeah, I talked about the other in my family spectrum. So my parents, when they come here, uh, my dad is in his 80s, he's older, he's on a walker. They usually do make it through this door, but um, when he needs to use the restroom, you know, try using a walker and navigate the men's restroom back there, okay? It's not something we should be asking people to do, especially those we love. 
In today's sermon, I don't know if coincidence, providence, John 4 uh, is our first reading today. We're talking about transformation of God's people. And what we see, though, is how God transforms our methods, our means, even our buildings. But his message is always constant. That's the same. But sometimes we have to change the way we do it to communicate that. And so I think what we're talking about today is just removing these barriers so people can better hear and feel his love and experience that transformation. So with that, um, we have a little bit of time left. Uh, We're going to pray some more. We're going to follow Tim's instruction, right? We're going to pray more. And uh, you should have that piece of paper. If there are any unanswered questions or comments that weren't covered during this, please write that down. And uh, you can turn that into the baskets on your way out. And I'm going to invite uh, Jamie Schroyer and Bob Watkins to close us in prayer. And then we'll all go get ready for church. Thank you for being here on time. Thank you for your attention. Those of you who came to early church, thanks for sticking around. And uh, we'll hope you hung out with the, uh, our Peach Ass friends uh, for lunch. Thanks, Jamie. may not be working. Let's start over. God heard us, but I want you to hear us. Remember I said to you, Lord, that some of our heads may be spinning. Some of our hearts may even be a little fearful. So I ask the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit to come and envelop each one of us now. I also pray for your wisdom. You know, in your word you've said, if any of you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you. And so that's our second prayer, Father, that wisdom would be granted. I pray that God of grace and God of glory grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. God of grace and God of glory, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. God of grace and God of glory, grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. And God of grace and God of glory, grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving thee whom we adore. May it be so, Lord. May it be so. In Jesus' name we pray. Continue in prayer. Lord God, we come to you this morning as both Creator and as Abba Father. Thank you for your great love supremely expressed through Christ Jesus. We thank you for his willing sacrifice that provides us the basis for our faith and your acceptance of our life offering before the throne of grace. We thank you for your spirit that enables our faith and lifts to you the prayers of our heart. And we thank you for the church that you gifted through your spirit to become the very body of Christ on this earth, here, in this local body of believers. First Presbyterian Church of Orland. We deeply cherish this local body and jealously guard our fellowship against failure and disruption 
as we look to you for guidance and acceptance of our service in this place. We acknowledge our failures and neglect, and we pray you would help us to grow in your grace and to want nothing more than to be your willing servants individually and as a body. May we be unified in our pursuit to that end. We need above all else to be guardians of your perfect truth under the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. And yet, Lord, we so often neglect to pray and our actions are self-serving instead of seeking your will and the greater good of this body. Help us to learn the humility of our Lord Jesus that through prayer we might truly know your heart and your will. Bless our comings and goings on the Father as we worship you three in one. We pray in the name of our living Lord Jesus and through the very powerful presence of your Holy Spirit that even now brings our prayers to your throne of grace.